The following presentation of City Cinematheque is made possible in part by support from the American Scandinavian Foundation and the Consulate General of Sweden in New York. Welcome to City Cinematheque, where the art and pleasure of the movies are the subject of serious discussion. I'm your host, Jerry Carlson, and I teach film studies at the City College of the City University of New York. Today, we're going to be looking at some contemporary Scandinavian cinema, the 1993 Swedish production, The Last Dance. While this is a completely Swedish film, that is, the central characters are all Swedes, central characters are two contemporary Swedish couples, in fact, the director is of British birth, Colin Nutley. We'll be talking about this new hybrid form of European cinema, about the structure of this work, and about its fascinating portrait of Sweden today after today's screening. And as our guest, it's a special pleasure to tell you that it is Colin Nutley, the director of the film, who will be joining us. Now, take a whirl around the ballroom as you watch The Last Dance. Welcome back to City Cinema Tech. I hope you've enjoyed this opportunity to see a film that I don't think has been seen as much as it should be seen in our country because it represents the quality of a film that's being made in Europe today and that we don't have as much of a chance to see as perhaps we should. Um, that said, we do have a big chance today, and that's to chat with the writer and director of the film, uh, Colin Nutley. Welcome to City Cinema Tech, Colin. Thank you very much. Great. I think. I just have to start with the most obvious of obvious questions. We're in the midst of a Scandinavian um, little mini festival here on the station, surveying mm -hmm. a number of things. And here's a terrific Swedish film. And here's a man whose name, uh, demeanor, and accent announced that he is British. How did, how did you become a Swedish film director? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, like everything else in life, by accident, I was an assistant director working for a television company in England. And um, I was working on a series of dramas with um, a particular director, an Irish director. And uh, I'd worked with him for three years. And we came to Sweden to make a drama. And uh, I wasn't actually going to do that with him. I was going to do another job. But the person who did it was actually sacked from the company. And they brought me back in two days before he went to Sweden. I went with him. Uh, the first trip was um, a nightmare. It was like going, to, I mean, it felt, as an Englishman going to Sweden for the first time in the middle of the winter, it felt like going to Russia. I mean, it was a very big kind of culture shock. But to go back to Sweden in the summer was just the most fantastic experience you ever could have. And uh, um, I was there for two months. And as you do, I mean, you fall in love with the country normally because you fall in love with somebody, I guess. So it was about landscape and people. And uh, um, while the relationship went on then in a kind of England, Sweden, holidays, making friends way, but slowly it reached a point where it was not good enough to go there for a holiday. I wanted to work and it was quite long. I mean, Sweden is like a very small country and quite a small sort of village. Uh, atmosphere mentality and so it's quite hard actually to come in but right. once you come in then it's the most welcoming country you ever could be in. Yeah. Let me just ask the, the second thing which is the linguistic feature because mm. I mean you're one of the things that's so distinguished about this film is the extraordinary acting uh, in, in the film. We can talk about that and a lot of right. other things but I mean let me just say the most obvious thing they're acting in Swedish and you're directing them in Swedish. What about that linguistic shift? Mm. Well you know 
If we were doing this interview in Sweden, the first question you would have asked me is why are you still working here and not speaking Swedish? Because I'm known in Sweden for the fact that I rarely speak Swedish. Uh, that's just my own problem, you can say. But when you work within a film, your concentration is so high. And I understand Swedish, uh, maybe not totally fully, but more or less fully. Right. Um, but I write in English, you see. I mean, I never write my script in Swedish. We work in English. The crew all speak English. We go all the way through. I've made seven films in Sweden. And uh, um, I mean, each one of those films, we work the same way. So it's a kind of rollover. But I have a way of working which is very inclusive with the actors. OK. Um, so I mean, right up until not long before we shoot, we're still speaking English, and then we roll across. What happens, I think, is that you take the actors kind of out of their own heart and soul and country and they sink in English and then they have to go back in. There's something quite interesting that happens, I mean, within that process, I think. Uh, no, no, no. It, it, it's, it's a way of getting out and getting into, yeah. another, yeah. Uh, getting into another character. It also bespeaks one of these uh, things which, uh, in a country like the United States, perhaps we don't understand as much as almost any European understands, and that's uh, the degree to which many people live uh, shifting from one language uh, to, to another. That's right. That, that being in a place in which you're operating fully or even partially in another language for a mm. period of time mm. does not necessarily impede one's professional life or social relations or... Not at all. In fact, I mean, what is interesting is that I've lived now in Sweden for eight years, I think. I'm actually seven or eight years I've now lived there. But more and more and more, the conversations between me and people that I work with and me and friends is they speak Swedish, I speak English. It's kind of bizarre when you stand in a room for the first uh, two minutes and realize, wait a minute, these two people, you know, how can I? <laughs> but what is so, the thing about language, you can understand, but if you have a problem with language, it's always when you go to speak it. I mean, you get tongue tied, you lose words, you feel you can't explain right. yourself properly. And the crucial thing is, can you communicate? It's the only thing that matters, actually. Right, and uh, and as we and as this demonstrate, not all forms of communication are verbal. I mean, that's it's so obvious, no. but it but it's something that's so obvious that perhaps you don't. One doesn't even know the full impact no. of it until you subtract the language uh. component and then learn uh. how what the other components uh, are through experience. Uh. Well, let's let's go back to the the the, the script yeah. uh, uh, of this film. Now, you've been making a number of films right. in Sweden. Yep. What's the process by which? Um, you've been getting films made. I mean, are you commissioned uh, to write a script? Or uh, take us a little bit through right. that process of how The Last Dance got made. OK. Um, the Last Dance was my fourth feature film in Sweden. So by then, uh, I was kind of within the system. And the system in Sweden works like this. We have a very good uh, um, Film Institute, which is very well backed by the government. So the cinema is, I think, when you come outside of Sweden and look back in, we're extremely well looked after. Swedes love Swedish cinema. Right. Um, I think Sweden and France have the two biggest audiences in Europe for their own films. So, I mean, there is, uh, um, you're in a country where the average person is very concerned about culture, and part of that is film. So, you have uh, the ability to apply at the institute for an, uh, an amount of money which is uh, maximum nine million crowns. So that is for you what? For me as an Englishman, that is something like uh, 800,000 pound. OK, so that's about a million and a half dollars. Yes, so there, there you start. And I mean, that's essential for most filmmakers to have. We have two major companies in Sweden. SF, who I've always worked with, although, funnily enough, Sister Dance was at the last dances for the other company, right. Sandref's. And those two companies are both involved in production, distribution, and between them, they own all of the cinemas in Sweden. So you have to have one of those on board right. to get your money from the Institute. But basically, you can say, between the Institute, between uh, the television, and between somebody like SF, Sandref's, or one of the other major money sort of inputs, you will make the film. Okay. An average, I mean, my films on average, which are in Swedish terms to the top end of uh, 
a budget cost around 22 to 24 million, say 2 million pound. Okay, so uh, about close to close to 4 million, 3, yep. three 5 yep, to 4 exactly. million. Exactly, and that's considered uh, in Sweden top end. Okay. Um, well, I mean, you achieve your money. I'm lucky now that I'm sort of within the system known and uh, touch wood, my films work <laughs> with, the, they have a, a sort of history of working with the audience. So uh, the gamble is uh, considered as safe as it can be with me, even though of course it's never right. safe. So for me now, I can make a film, finish the film and decide what the next film is gonna be and go into the system and roll on. So Sweden is extremely supportive. No. Uh, it has many uh, wonderful lighting cameramen, I mean world-class lighting yeah. cameramen, very good actors in depth, um, and a very good support system. It's just a great place to work, yeah. as simple as that. Well, it's producing great films as well. One of the issues of this series, as you heard in my uh, introduction as we mm. came back from this uh, is the fact that there is a cinema of this quality mm. uh, that has some difficulty uh, in distribution in oh. the United in the United States. It's I mean, it's, it's 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 a it's a frustrating uh. situation for both for people who love the the cinema and also for the people making the cinema who want mm. to engage with us as an audience as uh, as well. Uh, it is worth uh, recounting that uh, Variety, the trade magazine, several years ago. Uh, did a study of this, and if you flash back some 30 years to the mid to late 60s, mm -hmm. there were uh, s close to 100 international films, the majority of them subtitled, with a few British and Australian films, released in the United States each, uh, each mm -hmm. year, released theatrically. That's uh, amazing. It's, that's amazing. Well, that has fallen to by the standard of theatrical distribution, that has fallen to less than 25. So the illusion, I mean, people think, am I, you know, am I crazy or is there just a lot less around? It, they're not crazy. There has been quite literally a 75% decline in the availability of international mm. subtitled product within American theaters. And that's, uh, that, uh, unfortunately, that narrows our scope. I mean, like you know. Uh, I mean, we make, I think in Sweden on average, we are making between 22 and 25 feature films a year for a country of eight and a half million people. I mean, that's quite it's a, it, fantastic. No, that's absolutely um, right. on the, uh, Interestingly enough, my assistant actually is a girl called Lisa Lot and her father is Vilgot Quarman, and Vilgot Quarman made I Am Curious Yellow and Blue, and I think that is still one of the most successful right. uh, foreign films uh, in America. I mean, those days are gone. But much of that is also, it's to do with you, but it's also to do with us. I mean, it is very much about how we market the product that we make, and we're trying to learn that in Sweden now, that I mean, we need to be more aggressive and we need to be more collective in the way that we um, attack different territories and uh, stand with some confidence behind uh, the work that is done. So I mean, much of it is about uh, ourselves, I think. Well, uh, an interesting, uh, I think, uh, addendum to that is that uh, while we are in a very interesting moment in American mm -hmm. cinema, uh, given some of the extraordinary talent in the American independent cinema, and there's always uh, mega talent yeah. in, in, uh, in Hollywood, one of the things about American independent filmmakers that I always find uh, very interesting and admirable is no matter how long they've maintained their integrity and independence, they also understand that there's a significant moment of engagement mm. with the American marketing mm. system and distribution system in getting it mm. out there. So I don't know anybody who on principle has turned down a deal to be distributed with a people like October mm. or Miramax mm. or whatever because they know that they know how to get movies to people. That's right. uh, and that's, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of stages to mm. this complicated mm. process and that's the last, uh, the last, the last that's stage. That's right. Um, so let's, but let's get back to the last dance yeah. it's, itself. Where did um, this story come from? You just come from a film our audience may not know very much about called House of, House of Angels, mm. uh, an extraordinarily uh, well-regarded film and a very, very popular film uh, in, mm. in Sweden and quite different mm. uh, from this one. Where was, where was this film coming from? 
This film came from the fact that two or three different things. One is that uh, when I was a child, my grandmother lived in Portsmouth, uh, near the dockyard in rather a poor area. And just around the corner from my gran, my brother and myself used to go and walk, and there was a little Victorian terrace, and uh, in one of these houses, through the window, we used to see lots of trophies. And there lived in this uh, house uh, a bus driver, and he was married to a lady who owned a small flower shop, but they were at the time the world amateur ballroom dancing champions, you know. And this was no just... No kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and this room was just full of trophies, and, there was, and we used to watch them on television. So we could go around the corner and look through the window and see them, and we could then go home and once a week we could see these two uh, people on television. There was something so strange about that, number one. Number two, uh, I remember actually reading, just before I started to write this script, there was a story in America, I think, about a mother who wanted her daughter to be the cheerleader of the school football team. And Houston, she just, Texas. Right. Mm -hmm. My state I hail from. Well, there you are. And, I, you know, your head goes around this thing. How can something so unimportant be so important that you're prepared to kill? Yes. And in Sweden, there is a, a dance phenomena, you could say. I mean, there are uh, eight and a half million people in Sweden and just under a million dance every weekend. Not this kind of dance right, in the film. But, they're, but they're, they're, they dance to Swedish dance bands. It's very special. And dance, as such, grows very much. This kind of dance is in the film. So, I mean, I grew up watching uh, uh, once a week this thing uh, called Come Dancing on Television with my father. He loved it. And this world is bizarre. And so I kind of put this, and, and you understand, when you start to go to these dances and you see the way people behave, they are driven uh, maybe on a lower level, but maybe some on the same kind of level as the lady in Houston, Texas, or wherever it was. So I just thought it would be fun to make a film about, you know, two couples and this kind of drive of uh, jealousy and uh, something so unimportant against something so important they can't have children. I mean, this was like... Um, and there is much about life in Stockholm. Stockholm is a particular city with... Uh, um, it's small, everybody knows each other. We're here in New York now, we sit in a restaurant this lunchtime, we meet uh, a Swede, uh, very closely connected to us. I mean, that's the way it is in Sweden. You all know one another very, very well. And so it's got that small town mentality, and there's much good about that, there's much very bad about that as well. So really, The Last Dance was to look into things that are unimportant in life and things that are important in life. Um, that's it. Well, that's no, <laughs> it's, you know, it's, 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 no, it's, it's, it's quite enough. And, and if, if uh, you'll, uh, you know, <laughs> forgive me for complimenting you while you're, while you're sitting here, I mean, it works marvelously in the film of the creation of this uh, purposely hermetically sealed mm. world of the dance halls and the way in which you set up the contrast between that and the variety of psychological uh, but also culturally motivated because it's not mm. doesn't it, this is not a film uh, I, that takes place in a in a cultural vacuum no. uh, of, of any kind no. I mean you use the you use the imagery specifically of Stockholm and it's not and it's not um, you know tourist imagery of no. any of of any kind and you there's this uh, I find this wonderful contrast uh, not only in the lighting schemes but the kinds of camera movements you're using and cutting mm. to express the world that is there when they're inside the ballroom mm. uh, world as opposed to the, the scenes outside mm. of the ballroom, uh, ballroom world. Before we go, anything, go any further on the, the last dance, you know, we, we have to confront, uh, when you confront Swedish cinema, there's one person that you have to confront. You know, this John Smith. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll just call him John. Yeah. <laughs> to be known. You know, <laughs> uh, as and of course you. There is 
um, you know, <laughs> citation of John Smith, a.k.a. Mm. Ingrid Bergman. Mm. I, in, I, no, I, I'm always joking about Americans <laughs> and Ingmar Bergman yeah. uh, in the television mm. as, as, they are, as they are watching um, as, as the Bergman film comes uh-huh. on the television, television set. So what, I mean, what kind of shadow uh, or what kind of uh, presence is, is, is cast or, or nothing? It's not a shadow. It's a, it's a black hole, in a way, you could say. It's enormous, of course. Yeah. I mean, uh, there is much discussion um, on a daily basis about... In a way, you know what it's like. I mean, Bergman is like you know, a very fast ship that goes through the water. And, of course, as it goes through the water, I mean, it leaves this enormous nothingness behind. And so there is, of course... Uh, a great danger when you have that kind of a power within a country as small as Sweden as to can you contain that and uh, what comes after, what can you do right. at the same time. So there's, uh, it's a huge discussion, <laughs> mostly, in Ongoing, to- most, <laughs> mostly in toilets, but it's a huge discussion. I mean, of course it is. I mean, everybody is uh, utterly respectful of who Bergman is. Um, but, I mean, I'm in New York now with uh, um, my last film as well, and right. Johan Wiederberg is in that film, and his father, uh, it's a very big discussion as to whether you will consider Wiederberg the most important director of these last years, or Bergman. Uh, I think there are two strong camps, and uh, it's strange with Bergman, really. I mean, he... Of course, it's an enormous talent, but uh, there are moments when, inevitably, having that kind of talent sitting on top of a business uh, like ours, which is, I mean, everybody knows everybody. Right. Uh, my cameraman, his father shot the first 23 Bergman films. He shot the Bergman film that is on the television in my film. You have these kind of connections all the way through, and uh, uh, so it's not a big place where you can kind of escape things that you want to escape. Can I, can I play trivia for just a second? As I remember, your sound man, Eddie Oxberg, uh, is, a major sound, uh, is a major person for Jan, uh, for Jan Troel and played a major role oh, yeah. in The Emigrants in the New Absolutely. Land. Great, great Swedish, Swedish films. And, and here I'm you know, looking at the credits of this uh-huh. and I'm saying, oh, I know who that, you know, well, it's strange because Eddie's worked with me for six films now, and uh, he still acts actually now and again. But um, when you go on a shoot and Eddie is on the crew, they're much more likely to not rush up to one of your lead actors. They're more <laughs> likely to say, Eddie Expert, <laughs> and rush across to Eddie. So, um, but he's a wonderful character still within the business, and. Uh, I think he's actually just been working on a film now as an actor. Okay. Okay. Good. Well, let me let me let's talk. Let's take it to that at, on that acting line yeah. as uh, as well, because uh, another one of the distinctions of this film, of, of, aside from you know its visual style, I think it's it's mm. portraiture mm. of a contemporary Sweden, a society that is you know well ordered, organized, mm. and prosperous, and 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 hardworking. And therefore, there's an underbelly to that that this film is exploring. In addition to that, I think anybody who sees the film it will be taken simply by the quality of performance mm. uh, in, this, um, in this film. T- since many of these actors and actresses are not familiar mm. to American audiences, what kinds of backgrounds do they uh, do they have? Are you with people who have been working a, a great deal in Swedish theater as well, television? Yeah. I mean, the... Uh... Stockholm has more theatres than any city in Europe. It's just full of theatres. And the background of Swedish actors is absolutely firmly based in theatre. And that, when you start to work with many of them, is a major problem. Um, They have a wonderful depth of actors. I mean, there are fabulous actors in Sweden. And, I mean, you could work, I could work for the rest of my life and still be finding new actors of uh, world-class talent, I think. But many of them are theatre-bound. And uh, so, I mean, the journey from theatre to film is 
for a director, I think, uh, thrilling to kind of make them come across and break down that theatre thing. But still, in this film, I mean, you have uh, um, Raina Brunovson, who plays the husband who can't father children. Uh, he's absolutely one of the present-day best actors in Sweden. Uh, you have uh, Helena Bastrom. She is, without doubt, I guess, one of the top two or three female actors in Sweden working now. Um, you'll notice that I didn't say she's also my wife. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I wasn't going to say I was trying anything. to say, how do I go through this now and, and sort of keep my dignity? But, um, and then you have uh, Eva Froning. She was in Fanny and Alexander with Bergman. She's just a wonderful actress. And uh, the least known at the time was uh, Peter Anderson. But Peter's now become uh, much better known. And these all had film experience. But um, it's wonderful actors, but they're inevitably most of the work is theatre. Right. Well, one of the things about a number of the scenes in the film that, that, that draws our attention to the acting, mm. but I don't mean as, you know, Bravura acting for bravura acting no, no. in place. I mean, I mean, in place, uh -huh. in context, balanced within the within the film is the way in which, in a number of the interior sequences, you use very few camera uh, yeah. setups uh, and allow the action to play out and be developed mm. for itself with uh, you know a, a striking intensity within the intimacy of those uh, of those settings. Now, uh, how do you how do you work with actors for uh, for that? I work in, uh, um, well, I work in many different ways. I mean, working with actors well is knowing who the actors are. And so with some actors I work one way and with others another. But basically, my kind of dream always is to take actors beyond acting, you can say. I mean, acting per se is rather boring. It's mm. people showing off in front of a camera. And uh, um, we play a game at home to see who's the fastest to guess are they on script or off script when a film starts? <laughs> um, because, of course, there are many actors that can act on that level very well. And the trick, you feel, is, or the thrill as a director is to try and take them beyond. You do that by many different ways. I mean, uh, the actors are not knowing with me until maybe 10 minutes before we shoot the scene exactly what is going to happen, number one. Uh, we never, the only person that can ever switch the camera off is me. Uh, if a camera runs, they know they have to survive. So, I mean, it could well be that we'll start a scene that we've rehearsed and we'll reach the end of that scene and I will keep running. Uh, maybe it's rubbish, maybe it's good. I will tell one actor one thing, I will tell another actor another thing. I play bluff, double bluff. I mean, I play all sorts of games on them. And I've worked with this cameraman now for 12 years, so we know this is a scene that we're going to hold on a single shot and what you see is what you get. Right. Uh, this is a scene that is never going to work in that way. So, so I mean, we, we work in different ways, but basically performance thrills me. Right. People thrill me. Uh, and I want them to do the same to you. And I mean, of course, I can thrill you by cut, 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 cut. It's a little bit boring, I think. Right, 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 right. right. I think we've all seen MTV. Mm. Exactly. I mean, it's just boring. Good, good. We just have a, f a few seconds left, so what I'd like you to do is you have a film that we are likely to see over right. the next year or so. Tell us what the title is and tell us just in a sentence or two about it. Well, we have a film actually right now which has just been selected to represent Sweden in the Oscars this year. Uh, it's called in uh, English Under the Sun. Um, it is with Helena. It is with Johan Wiederberg. It is with uh, uh, an, a male actor, Rolf Laskord, who I guess is the sort of major male actor in Sweden right now. It's actually a script that I wrote from an 18-page short story by H.E. Bates, the English writer. And it's a story about a man, 40 years old, living in a small farm in the middle of nowhere. He goes and places an advertisement in the local paper saying that he's looking for a housekeeper. We're going to have to... We have to That's leave it. the audience hanging from there. <laughs> if you'd like more information about City Cinematheque, drop us a line. Drop it to City Cinematheque, City University Television, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Let me give you that information again. City Cinematheque, 
City University Television, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Sorry to cut you off, but sometimes a cliffhanger is the best way to get Absolutely. out. Absolutely. Okay, thanks for joining us, Thank Bob. you very much indeed. Great. And thanks for joining us once again on City Cinema Tech. I hope you join us again for more classics of international film. Thank you. Bye-bye. The preceding episode of City Cinema Tech was made possible in part by support from the American Scandinavian Foundation and the Consulate General of Sweden in New York.